Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Asini Tara, present treasurer. And my name is Sunil Bilwase, present secretary of Chess Nepal. Now we will be the host for the today's space talk. We'll, we give a warm welcome to all of our guests and the audience today, and we hope you all are doing well. Our audience today comprises the members from Space Nepal and its various chapters like Space KU, Space uh, Saint Javier, Oras Nepal, Astrova SC States, and other space enthusiasts. And the speaker for our Nepal Switch Space Talk since today is Dr. Thomas Singh, CEO and founder of the Deployable Cube D. So, first, let me introduce Space Nepal. We are Nepal's national chapter of the student for the exploration and development of space. We are a student group interested focus on space exploration. Our main motto is to learn, share, expand our space knowledge by gathering space enthusiasts from all over the country. We conduct events such as space talk and different space related projects through different chapters. And now let me introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Thomas Singh. He is the CEO and the founder of the Deployable Cube D company. Dr. Thomas worked for five years at the European Space Agency, ESA, and the Munich-based space company. Later, realizing the future of the space industry, he founded the Deployable Cube D to lead the new space. DQD or the Deployable QD is a new space company loaded in the Munich that develops the mechanism and the deployable structures for the small and nano satellites. It's great to have you here today with us. Welcome to our talk, Dr. Thomas. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. It's a um, great pleasure to talk to all of you here uh, from our um, new office in uh, Munich. Uh, so right now it's still quite uh, empty because we are moving uh, right now from our old place to here. So uh, I hope uh, in a future talk, uh, I can also show you some hardware because here is actually where our uh, space hardware will be built in the uh, near future, hopefully starting on uh, Tuesday. So um, I will get uh, right into my uh, presentation. I thought I will give you a quick overview about uh, what uh, has been um, done on the field of deployables, why we need deployables unfolding structures, and um, what is the current trend in the um, space industry and why we decided to uh, found our own company. So I hope um, my, you understand me uh, well. Uh, before starting presentation, I would like to introduce our attendees for today's talk. So, Okay. okay. First, okay. First, we have here Pradeep Dasreshta. He is the founder of Chess Nepal, and Saurabh Powder. He is a research and development uh, engineer at Orion Space. And Suraj Singh Pardhan. He is the current president of Chess Nepal. Uh, Mohan Tamang. He is the current vice president of Chess Nepal and coordinator for rocketry projects. Uh, Orash Nepal, which is also a chapter of Chess Nepal, and uh, Pragyam Malik. He is the current event manager at Chess Nepal. Thank you. Well, I'd like to inform the audience that they can present their questions through the comment section for the space talk. We'll be responding to them at the end of the session. So now, Thomas, if it's all right with you, we'd be glad if you'd like to begin yes. the presentation. Of course. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's great to hear that so many of you are here. and want to hear what we are doing here at uh, the Cubed in uh, Munich. So uh, my talk is um, on thinking outside the box, uh, how deployable structure enable high performance uh, small sat uh, missions. And I want to uh, start with uh, who I am, <laughs> because um, with the introduction, uh, just one sentence is a little bit short, so I thought, I'll spend some time uh, going a little bit into uh, detail uh, here because it will also come back uh, later in my presentation. So um, I uh, grew actually up uh, close to uh, Stuttgart, um, directly um, close to a city called, or a town called Lamboldshausen. It's where um, the Europeans were testing their uh, rocket engines. So uh, when I grew up, uh, in the forest behind my house, uh, there was the European rocket engine testing site for Ariane and Vega. And every time 
uh, when the um, window was shaking or there was smoke coming out of the forest, we knew that there was a, a rocket uh, test going on. And it was the start of uh, why I got uh, passionate about uh, space. And then I decided to uh, start uh, studying aerospace uh, engineering in uh, Stuttgart. Uh, then decided that uh, Germany is a little bit too uh, black and white. Uh, I wanted to uh, see if there's a possibility to do things uh, faster. So I went for uh, two years um, to America, uh, studied uh, their um, aerospace uh, structures, so adaptive structures, so shape changing uh, structures, uh, did my master's there um, and then I still did not want to go back to Germany and I spent uh, my PhD in um, Scotland uh, where I was uh, working on a couple of um, experiments that actually launched uh, things into space. Well, structure. I will say something more uh, about it later and um, after that I uh, joined ESA for a year in the structure section uh, but there I realized that the European Space Agency is um, a lot of uh, paperwork, a lot of documentation, and I thought, ah, there must be also something done uh, better. Um, and so I joined a small company in uh, Munich. They were building deployable structure for uh, bigger satellites, and I was there for five years. Um, but also there, I did not feel it, um, that they are really developing something uh, fast enough because in space, um, especially here in Europe, a uh, normal space project takes between 10, 20, 30 years from the first idea until they are um, flown. Because you always have to account for um, government budget to, um, so that the government is uh, following um, the same program and not just uh, skipping it like you see with the moon program one president says, says we go to the moon other says we go to Mars and at the end we don't go uh, anywhere so uh, that's actually me uh, last year I had an opportunity to go on a zero uh, gravity uh, flight so a parabolic flight with uh, CNES where we were trying some deployable structure and we also had the possibility to do some uh, free floating time. So it's in a plane, you go up and then it uh, dives back down. And uh, on the top, you have around 30 seconds of uh, weightlessness. And it was really a weird feeling because when um, at first you, you feel uh, two and a half uh, Gs on your body, you should normally uh, lie down because otherwise you uh, get sick. And then uh, when you uh, are uh, entering zero gravity, it feels like when you're on a free fall tower that you're falling uh, out of the plane that you are going on the ceiling and then you just have 30 seconds of uh, flying around and it's really a weird feeling because it messes with your um, or orientation so there was one time I was uh, filming my colleague which is in the back with the uh, yellow socks that is upside down right now uh, I was filming him and then when I was uh, taking down the camera the whole plane uh, looked um, at it as it was upside down so you could not tell anymore what, what is actually the ceiling and what is the um, floor um, so it's really messes good that it gave us good uh, medication so um, yeah so I'm always trying to do uh, fun things and really enjoy um, enjoy what I'm uh, doing because otherwise it's not a a uh, good thing that you spend so much time of your life uh, doing something that you don't like. You should have a uh, passion and then you can really uh, do uh, greatness. So um, that brings me to my uh, presentation. Um, so right now there is a um, trend in the space industry um, where uh, new players uh, disrupt uh, how uh, space is done. So um, there is, uh, they, they call it a new space and there is old space or classic space because the company that are in the old space section, they don't want to be called old space. Old space is, um, as I said before, you um, have uh, government uh, contracts. The government decides uh, where it uh, should go to uh, the space um, mission and the profit is made uh, with these government contracts and it's made here on earth. 
So uh, if the um, government says, ah, we go to the Mars, all the technologies, all the companies will get uh, projects to um, develop these systems uh, to uh, go to uh, moon. And when the government changes or a project runs over cost, then it gets scrapped and um, the company loses money, but not as much because they still get a contract again from the government. And now uh, comes new space. New space is more um, about being very agile, seeing where there's a business case uh, in space or getting to space. So really making money with um, customers. So for example, one of the uh, leaders here is uh, clearly SpaceX. They uh, revolutionized um, how we access space and also uh, how we um, will use space in the future because they said, uh, um, you know, Musk wanted to go to uh, Mars, wanted to colonize Mars. Um, then he went to the Russians, wanted to buy a rocket. They said, ah, oh, we're not selling you our rocket. Uh, you're a crazy person. So then he decided to build his own uh, rocket. And yeah, you all know what SpaceX is doing. I have also some nice uh, pictures in the following to really uh, show that uh, this is the way. Because in the process, he's also disrupting the whole industry with uh, cheaper access to space. There's uh, possible to launch uh, hundreds and thousands of satellites. And um, then you're not relying on any government. You have a business plan and you uh, go towards that. And the idea is also to go more for um, higher risk. So um, to really develop something, try it. If it does not work, learn from the mistakes, then just do it uh, better the next time. And not like uh, with all the old space programs where you are like spending so much time uh, just uh, writing paper and documenting uh, things. For example, um, if you know the ISS, the European uh, module on it, um, it's the Columbus module, it's in front of the uh, ISS. Um, this alone had uh, 13 um, trucks full of uh, paper, just the whole documentation for this can attach to the ISS, so it's crazy. And that's what also is, uh, what new space is changing, less meetings, more getting things done and showing that it can be done. Because uh, if you have hardware on the table, it's really hard to uh, discuss it uh, away. So here is a, a famous picture from, I think it's now already two years ago, from um, the first Falcon Heavy launch when, um, Elon Musk sent his uh, Tesla on top of the rocket. Um, and it's just amazing how much uh, outreach, how much uh, passion you can generate with uh, these uh, kinds of launches with new space. And um, if, yeah, something like that would not have been uh, possible with um, uh, old space uh, company or the government because they all say, ah, you're not launching your car on top of uh, the rocket that we are paying for. Um, you need to launch uh, just the dummy mass, doesn't matter. Then if we uh, go a little bit uh, further, it's like uh, this was presented in 2016 at a, a ISC from Elon Musk. It's about um, the Starship uh, concept and how he can uh, colonize uh, Mars. And uh, he said he can do it uh, by the end of the uh, decade already. And if you uh, watch uh, what's currently going on in uh, Boca Chica in Texas, it's like crazy. They are uh, building uh, spaceship parts uh, by the day. So there's uh, great um, YouTube uh, channels where they have updates uh, twice a week where they really show that they are building these things. They are trying them. If it explodes, yeah, it's not so bad because then you learn how uh, to do it uh, differently. And that's the other thing that uh, they are doing is um, they are building really uh, small uh, satellites uh, called uh, Starlink satellites. And uh, they can launch uh, 60 to 70 of them in one uh, launch. And uh, the idea is to bring internet to the whole world uh, from space. And this is also something that uh, was never thought could be possible. The same as with uh, returning uh, rockets 
uh, with landing the rockets before it was always uh, you need to throw the rocket away after uh, its mission is done and that was just a um, common thing because none of the uh, space agencies or the government want to take the risk to uh, fund this uh, development. Now even at ESA they are thinking of uh, funding a project where they look into if they can recover parts of uh, Ariane and Vega but it's just paper studies. He is just uh, doing it. So um, going into the uh, small sets, so here I uh, borrowed a couple of slides from Euroconsult uh, from their 2018 uh, report. It's um, getting really interesting that uh, small sets, so these uh, satellites up to uh, 500 kilogram can uh, really start uh, to replace uh, bigger satellites because before the satellites were the size of a, a bus and it was uh, cost multiple uh, billions to build one of these. Now uh, one um, of these um, um, Starlink satellites is just uh, down to uh, 300,000 euros, which is actually nothing. And um, that's really uh, amazing because then you can start building uh, huge uh, constellations to bring internet from space. You can even beam down power. You can observe the um, Earth uh, at in real time. You can detect wildfires. You can really detect if there is some um, 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 environmental effects and that was only possible with uh, small satellites because these big satellites, okay, they have more uh, power, but they are only at one spot at one time. So uh, here in this uh, chart above, it's really uh, clear that there is increase in uh, small satellite launches and there's also many uh, companies that are developing right now uh, rocket um, launches. It started with uh, SpaceX. Then uh, for smaller rockets, it's a Rocket Lab. And now uh, there are so many companies building own rockets. Even here in Germany, there's right now three companies uh, developing small size rockets. One here in Munich, one just 50 kilometers away, and the other one just 200 kilometers away. It's just crazy what uh, SpaceX and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos from uh, Blue Origin uh, kicked off here. Then if you look a little bit uh, further over the next uh, 10 years, it's actually uh, 9,000 satellites uh, that will be launched. And this does not even include the 12,000 satellites uh, from Elon Musk uh, on a Starlink uh, constellation. And he's even having plans to uh, expand it to uh, 40,000 satellites. So it's just crazy the amount of uh, satellites that uh, will be built in the next uh, 10 years and um, how many will be uh, launched. Okay, some many people say that will be also a problem with the space environment because with these Starlink satellites you get a lot of uh, light uh, pollution. The astronomers already say uh, the, they cannot do astronomy from uh, Earth anymore because they already have these uh, light uh, stripes from the satellites, then uh, you have a space debris uh, problem, but um, that should be also um, solved um, soon. Like SpaceX is right now uh, doing like uh, visors on their satellites to um, not uh, block, to not have such a high reflection. And uh, from space debris, they are also in such a low orbit that they are deorbiting rather fast. So, but with all these um, developments in small such CubeSats, um, there's still one uh, limiting uh, factor, which is uh, the launch cost. You still need to overcome the gravity of Earth and bring something uh, into space. And um, if you look at the rocket equation, it's still that 95% of the uh, mass, the energy is uh, used to bring the other five percent in uh, space. So what you want to do is you want to make your uh, satellite first as light as possible and then also uh, as small as possible because you only have a limited uh, space up there in the uh, fairing. And that's the nice thing with uh, CubeSats. 
and uh, no idea what happened now there <laughs> uh, with CubeSats and SmallSats they have a small uh, form factor so they can launch very cheaply because they are in a standardized container uh, but it will have uh, limitations uh, then in space and that's where um, our idea comes in it's uh, deployable uh, space structures so deployable means uh, you fold something uh, small uh, when it's in the rocket, so you can make use of the minimum payload um, uh, size. And once you're up, it can uh, deploy to any kind of shape. And the big advantage there is um, normally uh, these uh, spacecraft structures, they are designed uh, to withstand the launch load because they're big structures and with vibration uh, during launch, it's um, um, a sizing uh, factor. With deployables, you don't have to worry about it because it's in a very small container in launch. And then when it's up in space, it's big. So some of the uh, examples are um, space habitats, like inflatable uh, space station, like the one from Bigelow that unfortunately went uh, bankrupt uh, now due to uh, Corona. But there's also uh, plans of having uh, deployable space stations and space habitats on uh, the moon and the Mars, uh, because the idea could be that uh, you, you bring it uh, to uh, moon or Mars, you then uh, deploy it, and then you use a um, 3D uh, printer that prints the uh, regolith or the uh, Mars dust in a structure around the deployable to, search, uh, to protect from the uh, radiation. Then there's application in space uh, solar power that you uh, collect the energy of the sun uh, already in the atmosphere and then you beam it down with the laser or microwaves. Uh, with that uh, you actually have um, a much higher efficiency because you will lose 90% of the sun's energy while it is traveling through the atmosphere and with lasers and microwave you would um, half that or one third of it. Then there's deployable solar arrays, uh, solar sails, uh, where you use the uh, solar light as uh, propulsion. So you use the uh, photons that are impacting the surface and with the reaction force, you can propel your spacecraft through uh, space. There the area to mass uh, ratio is important because the bigger the area, the smaller the mass, the faster you can go. The other thing is also antennas and reflectors because um, you need uh, big uh, apertures, big diameters uh, in space. Otherwise, you need uh, to have it on the ground. And when you want to do a point-to-point -point communication, and especially going to small user terminals, you need uh, big structures in space. And you don't want to design something like this uh, to survive a launch, because it will probably not do it if it's built uh, rigidly. Going a step further, um, I want to talk to you quickly about uh, deployable structures for uh, these uh, small satellites. So here um, we see a big uh, need for this deployable structure because the CubeSat is just a, a multitude of a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter box and uh, having something deployed out of it is uh, very important. So here for Earth observation we see a uh, radar antennas that you have a much uh, um, smaller um, size of uh, the resolution uh, on the ground, then uh, Dragon solar sails uh, to use a deployable structure to actually remove debris. So you increase the area of the small satellite and then it uh, decays faster because you will have an effect of uh, solar drag up to uh, 700 kilometers. So it would go um, down quite uh, quickly. Then of course, solar panels, uh, you always need more energy in space for these small satellites because uh, you want to use electric propulsion, you want to have a higher bandwidth communication and for that you just need power. And then um, communication antennas, it's the same as the uh, slide before. Um, they are uh, one of the biggest uh, markets right now in small sets. Um, now I want to tell you uh, how um, this all uh, started. So when I started my PhD in um, stress light in Glasgow, um, 
the interest was uh, to look into deployable structures for space solar power satellite. Uh, so a satellite that could uh, use um, the sun's energy to either beam it uh, to Earth or to use it as a, a method of um, ditching asteroids. So if an asteroid would come, you concentrate the sun's energy on the asteroid and you would push it uh, out of the way. So in case um, you would have an asteroid heading uh, to Earth, you could uh, do it Armageddon style and just melt it or push it away. So the uh, motivation was, uh, it should be a structure that is lightweight, is a very low storage, should be reliable deployed because the thing is, if you uh, build something that should uh, deploy in space and it does not deploy, uh, you have a big problem because you cannot just go there and uh, uh, deploy it because the price to go to space is still 50, 60 uh, million euros uh, for such a mission. So <laughs> uh, good luck with uh, finding a sponsor. And then we also thought, ah, why not go a little bit further if this uh, structure can also change its shape uh, while it's uh, in orbit. So it can um, uh, fit many applications, um, that would be great. So we uh, looked a little bit further uh, into nature because the big advantage with uh, nature is that it has uh, 65, um, no, has a couple of billion years of, um, of uh, optimization behind her. So uh, we saw that ah, there are some flowers that follow the path of the um, sun. And um, this could be uh, done with like pressure changes within the, um, the flower uh, cells. And um, this would need not much uh, energy. So uh, it's really amazing to go around in uh, nature and to uh, figure out uh, how uh, nature solved it. So that's one of the big lessons learned during my PhD because not everything needs to be done um, new. There's a lot of things out there in general life which you think, ah, that's quite uh, neat and that you can then use in space. There's also one of the ideas in new space, you uh, reuse the things that you already have seen somewhere else and repurpose it for a space mission. Yeah, and then we did uh, this deployable structure like a crawling uh, robot and we can have a solar array that can change its shape and uh, do attitude control of the satellite. And also um, it can uh, refocus um, the sun's energy on a point. Yeah, the application, yeah, like I said just now is shape changing uh, sail, uh, solar um, um, power satellite, it can refocus the energy and also like flexible uh, robots. So we did a couple of experiments also uh, during that and uh, this all is leading in uh, why we started our own uh, company. So this was in uh, 2012. It was um, on a sounding rocket uh, mission it was uh, launching the experiment to uh, 100 kilometers and um, then setting it free. And here we had a um, spinning experiment. So the orange uh, box here was ejected from the rocket. Uh, once it was ejected, it was starting spinning and releasing this uh, net. And this net uh, was uh, like a substructure that you can use uh, to assemble uh, solar arrays on top and microwave transmitter in the bottom. So you have um, a solar array, um, microwave antenna uh, simultaneously, and you have uh, nets that are 100 by 100 or 200 by 200 meter um, big, and they are just stabilized by um, uh, rotation. And here are some of the uh, pictures from the uh, mission. So we um, actually uh, launched it. We had some interesting deployment mecha uh, mechanisms. Because in, that's also one of the problems with deployable structures. If you, um, you need to test it on the ground, but normally you only have uh, two dimensions that you can uh, control. Because uh, you can do it on an air table, you can do it on a, a gravity compensation table, but the third dimension is always missing. 
So that's why it's really important to go either to a, a sounding rocket experiment, check the technology, go on a, a parabolic flight, or then go for in-orbit demonstration because you cannot really uh, simulate this on ground. So that's why in-orbit demonstration missions are always important. The second experiment that we did was a shape-changing uh, membrane. So we had um, a structure that was, uh, when it was going into a space, it was uh, triggered um, due to the pressure decrease of the surrounding. There was a little bit of air in the pockets and it was forming actually um, an inflating structure. And if you can change the pressure in between cells, you get like something that changes its uh, surface and can then be used for all kinds of different applications. And the uh, interesting uh, thing here is this experiment was actually done with the um, uh, SETS uh, UK. So um, I'm, I was, it was a very exciting uh, group of people because we did it with the um, uh, SETS um, group of uh, stress glides. So that's why it's also called stress SATR because the uh, organization was stress sets. And yeah, we um, also involved almost everyone from sets um, in uh, Glasgow. So very exciting. And the thing here is uh, that we actually got uh, two flights with this experiment because on the first flight, they, uh, the launch provider forgot to plug in the pyro cutters. So the experiment was not actually um, activated. So we uh, got to go up to uh, Sweden uh, one more time and then uh, launch it. Uh, other experiment that we did was uh, to see if we can actually um, use a satellite, but get completely rid of the box because the box is actually only that mass that you launch. The, the box is not doing you um, any good in space. It's okay to have it in the rocket because it uh, protects your electronics and the payload uh, from um, the loads of the launch. But when you're up in space, you actually don't need the box. So the idea was that um, why not get rid of the box completely? You have the whole electronics of one satellite just distributed over the surface of a shape-changing uh, structure. And this we um, tested on a, a balloon flight. So we had a Wi-Fi uh, communication between the uh, cells. So there were two satellites that you see on the right with uh, captain cells in the middle uh, that got inflated with uh, residual air. And then uh, they could also uh, shape change and it was launched to 40 kilometers uh, for three to four hours. And it was a quite uh, interesting experiment. But the experiment, uh, the flight is only one thing. It's also all the uh, steps that you have until then because you do a lot of iteration and you actually uh, bring the um, mission further. Ah, by the way, I also have uh, one of my colleagues uh, still with me. I uh, introduced Hi. him a quick. It's uh, Alex, it's our head of manufacturing, assembly, integration, and testing. Um, yeah, Hello. as we are still uh, doing the renovation, he had to do the work while I have the fun of talking to all of you. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Good. So I'll uh, continue again. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> Good. And then we also did some work on uh, with together with NASA to really see if we can make this uh, mission a reality to uh, collect the sun's energy in a geostationary orbit and then beam it down to the ground to really bring uh, power to everywhere in the world. So also to remote locations, if you go hiking, if you run out of uh, energy on your uh, cell phone, you can charge it uh, from space. Uh, if uh, there's a plane crash and um, uh, there's all these uh, rescue boats, uh, you can also um, charge them or find them through space. But that's still a far away uh, concept, even though a lot of research is done here, but it requires a lot of uh, money to realize that. So that was uh, during my PhD. Then I went for a quick 
trip to ESA where I learned mostly about uh, how to um, write a lot of papers, how uh, to use uh, Word and how um, to really check uh, what, um, um, what the suppliers uh, were doing. And I only stayed there for one year. It was good to make the contacts, but then I wanted to work on real uh, hardware. And in uh, Europe, it's so that uh, the European Space Agency is giving the projects uh, to the industry and the industry is actually doing all the work, um, developing it and uh, building it, while ESA or the European Space Agency is just checking if uh, it will work at the end and uh, sign off of the paperwork. So here we actually did a deployable uh, drag sale for bigger satellite. So this was for a one and a half ton satellite. Uh, the edge length here is actually five meters. So we are going for, uh, um, so that's just a, a quarter of it. So we are going for 25 uh, meter drag sail. It was really used to um, remove uh, satellites from space. You would attach the sail on the satellite uh, before launch. And then after its mission time, the sail would deploy, uh, the drag would be um, bigger and it would come down within the 25 years that are required by the international uh, guidelines. And um, that was a quite uh, interesting uh, project. Um, one of the things that also came uh, out of it, um, I had always the passion with like really uh, small uh, satellites because there I saw uh, there's a future because if you uh, build a system for a small satellite, um, uh, you likely uh, build many of them. With the drag sale that you saw before, um, this work we are doing for the last uh, six years, and we're still um, four to five years away from the first uh, mission, from the first flight. And with these small uh, satellites, um, you can develop something much quicker because there's more uh, launches available. And also the uh, companies or the universities that are using these subsystems are more um, open to take risks because if one doesn't work, you can uh, just launch a second one. It's uh, not so expensive to build and launch a satellite, especially these small ones compared to the other. It's still expensive. You still need a couple of uh, 10,000, 100,000, but it's much cheaper than compared to 500, 600 million satellite. So here um, we, um, that was, in February of 2019, uh, we, um, I had a contact to um, the, one of the project managers at uh, Rocket Lab in New Zealand. It's uh, the first uh, small sat company or small launcher company that's actually uh, building uh, rockets to bring satellites up into space. So in the back, you see uh, how big this rocket is. It's 17 meters long. And uh, they said, ah, uh, on their uh, first commercial mission, they actually have a spot uh, free. Um, if we are able to uh, deliver hardware within uh, two and a half months, we could have the spot for free. And the spot was one kilogram. So uh, we then decided, okay, we'll just uh, see what we can do. Uh, before I was working with a master's student on developing of a, a CubeSat a drag sale. And we spent uh, almost every evening, all the weekends uh, building this thing, um, just building it, trying it, did not work. We changed it until it uh, worked. So a lot of my colleagues were saying back then, ah, that's not how you do space flight. You need to uh, write a lot of documents and then you uh, test it. But with that, we would not have been able to um, finish this project because we were able to uh, build it and qualify it in three months. Then we flew down to New Zealand. We met with uh, the guys from Rocket Lab. So here you see uh, Peter Beck. He is the CEO of Rocket Lab. Uh, and you also see the uh, drag sail. Then it was mounted on the rocket and it was uh, brought into space. So here you see our uh, small CubeSat in the middle of the uh, other rocket lab um, experiments and it was really exciting. But this was also um, when I realized in my old company, 
they thought we are uh, just um, doing it as a hobby. We are just, um, I'm not sure how to say it in English. It's um, more like bustle, more like uh, craft uh, work. So it's not really how you do space things. Space things needs to be expensive and needs to be uh, complicated. Uh, easy is not a thing that uh, resonates well with old space. So uh, here, we also uh, realized that um, uh, there was one um, release mechanism that we could not find anywhere on the world. And we decided, ah, we'll do it by ourselves and we start our own uh, company. And this is now where we are at uh, Deployables Cubed because we saw uh, right now it's very affordable to launch hundreds, thousands of these box size uh, satellites uh, but when they're in space, they need uh, bigger structures. And many of the products that are available right now are um, export uh, regulated because most of them come from the States and they cannot be used in any other satellite uh, outside the US or you have to go through a lot of uh, paperwork. So that's why we said, ah, let's build uh, deployable structures that are uh, commercially off the shelf. So uh, we are not uh, building uh, the same, uh, we're not building a specific uh, system for each customer because that drives up the price and the uh, time that it takes. But we develop um, custom um, commercially off the shelf products that are readily available. And then we can also have delivery times of not uh, one to two years, but um, two to three weeks. And when we do it in uh, Europe or any other place outside uh, the US, uh, it's export regulating uh, free. And I think it's the same for uh, Nepal as uh, well. Um, so the technology that we are using right now is uh, first, we are um, developing a mechanism. It's really just to uh, trigger the deployment. You can think of it like an umbrella. First, you need the um, switch. This is the actuator here and then the umbrella deploys by itself because if you go to a small start uh, missions, you don't need uh, many motors or so, you do it all with uh, start energy and then you can have um, different uh, deployable structures which are then drag sails, antennas, uh, so on. And uh, this is what we are working on right now. Uh, we have a pin puller and a release nut Application cases is for triggering a deployable structure. Uh, second one is uh, normally uh, these um, CubeSats are stored in a CubeSat container on the rocket because the nice thing there is um, these um, deployers are standardized and uh, don't cause any risk to the, um, to the rocket. So everybody can actually build a CubeSat, put it in the box and if something on the CubeSat breaks, if something falls off, it's not critical because it's inside the box. Um, so uh, then not every um, company needs to uh, qualify their uh, satellite so that the rocket company is happy with it. And then it's a hold down release mechanism that can be also used for um, uh, ejecting uh, satellites from the rocket, stage separation. And we are also working right now on a lunar lander to um, bring um, mission to the, to the moon and then have a lander detached, uh, a rover detached from the lander. If we look at the uh, deployable structures, now that we have the actuator, here uh, you can have um, deployable uh, antenna for communication, solar arrays to have uh, really high uh, power missions, which you really need for communication and for um, electric engine uh, missions, then um, deployable uh, drag sails um, to remove the space debris because um, propulsion with uh, sails is still more in uh, academic, academia, not really a business case, but also you can look at deployable radiators because you need to get uh, rid of all the uh, heat that you have in the satellite. So these are the, the main uh, things that we are currently uh, working with, or not currently, we are still waiting. Our workshop is here uh, finished. So uh, with that, I'm actually uh, through my press, ah, no, I have, I have the team still. <laughs> so yeah, uh, 
who we are. Uh, we have uh, me, I'm the CEO of uh, the Cube. We have uh, Michael Skies. Uh, he uh, did his PhD in 4D printing. So how you can have adaptive uh, structure that is optimized for having different shapes. Uh, then we have a, a finance and marketing uh, team from the terrestrial side, giving us some input on how to uh, do things uh, in real life, not just um, following the old space uh, steps. And then we have the whole engineering and product management team. So uh, Thomas um, launched already an inflatable in space. Alex, you just met our head of manufacturing assembly integration testing. Hugo has uh, over 10 years uh, experience in space analysis. And Professor Petras from the Hochschule München is giving us a nice uh, connection between academia and uh, space. So if any one of you ever thinks of doing a, a study uh, abroad, coming here to Munich, uh, the Hochschule München is a very good uh, university. It's more uh, practical while the other university, TUM and LMU are more theoretical. And then we're always happy to have interns and working students. And with that, we are quite a small team that can uh, deliver uh, products uh, in time and still has time for some crazy ideas. So with that, I'm uh, through and I hope I was not too short or too long. I think the time was good. So um, the thing that I just want to mention now at the end, it's we are in the beginning of a, a small set uh, revolution. They will not completely uh, replace uh, the bigger satellites, but uh, there will be a huge uh, market for these because they can enable missions that would not have been uh, possible before. And it's not just uh, small satellites, it's also uh, missions going outside uh, the Earth orbit. So going to the moon, um, having a delivery service to the moon, going for asteroids, asteroid mining, and then in the long term, really colonizing the moon and Mars. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we'll have some follow-up question for uh, that. So, right. uh, guys, if you have any queries, uh, you can uh, comment in the comment section. Shall I stop my sh screen sharing? I have a question on your slide, I think. Yeah, you mentioned a project called ISED, where there was the involvement of stratospheric balloon. So mm -hmm. is there any possibilities that we can independently launch, launch our CubeSat with those balloons? So the thing is, uh, with the balloon, uh, you can only get up to uh, 30, 40 kilometers. It's a very nice opportunity to uh, test your uh, systems before you actually go for real uh, space flight. And also um, these uh, balloons are available uh, quite easily because at the end you just need um, the balloon and the gas and then you need uh, just the communication and then you can uh, launch it uh, from almost wherever you uh, want, not really close to the airport, but so I can highly recommend uh, putting a team together and uh, doing such a mission by yourself because it's really easy to do. Yeah, what tax was carried out by that stratospheric balloon in your project? Oh, can you repeat the question? I didn't fully understand it. Yeah, there was a project uh, you mentioned that uh, there was the involvement of stratospheric balloon. So mm -hmm. what was the tax that you were carrying out through that balloon? Ah, okay, yep. Uh, let me go back. So here, ah, yes. So um, this was the stratospheric balloon and there was a gondola in the bottom and we had our experiment attached inside the gondola. So what we are, were doing is uh, we had these uh, two boxes 
Um, and uh, when we were up in 40 uh, kilometers height, um, where we didn't have a lot of um, air pressure anymore, we uh, opened uh, the two doors to really see is, if um, the satellite is uh, deploying. And the satellite uh, was um, made out of uh, five inflatable um, uh, balloons by itself or cells. And we had the electronics of one uh, satellite completely uh, distributed over it. And our purpose of the experiment was to see if we uh, first, if the two um, satellites can talk to each other, if they um, can um, coordinate uh, the actuation, because at the end they should uh, deform themselves with um, pressure change in between. I hope it was clear. <laughs> yeah. So there's one question. So uh, how does the vibration affect the electronic component? If yes, uh, then how to minimize the effect? So we have one rocketry project uh, ongoing mm -hmm. right now. So these are the, some queries from the team members. Yeah. So in the Unlike the deployable structure, if you do it uh, like this, um, you will have a lot of uh, material around it because you uh, fold it all together. So you get a lot of damping. Um, so it's actually better for the um, electronic uh, components because in a, a normal satellite, um, you have these uh, PCB boards, uh, which you cannot really be sure at which orientation they will be at the end in the rocket launch. And uh, then the um, soldering uh, points get really uh, critical because you could have, um, so if the PCB is mounted like this and the rocket is going up like that, you can have a bending uh, of the uh, PCB and uh, the electronic components on, on it are more rigid and you get a lot of stress on these uh, soldering points. So uh, one of the things that you can uh, do around it is to really figure out um, where the uh, load is coming from and really orienting the uh, more heavier parts of the boards uh, to the outside where you have the uh, mounting uh, places or uh, make a, a structure around it that is quite sturdy and is supporting the uh, PCBs. So one more question. So what type of actuators are more efficient to use for control mechanism like servo or servos? For control uh, mechanism where you have to um, go to a specific uh, position always or... Um, okay, I think I can uh, answer it. So if you um, need to have a high uh, precision then better to go with uh, stepper motors because there you can really um, count the steps uh, to a certain uh, position and with a um, and you can easily see if you lose uh, steps or not with the servo motors there's still a lot of um, um, accuracy uh, lost in the process. So I would say a stepper motor is the more precise actuator. Okay. And uh, what is the frequency range for satellite and does frequency for satellite are assigned according to their orbital position and how to register the frequency domain? So um, I think that's from country to country uh, different. There is a, a very nice um, summary of um, Cal Poly, the uh, California Polytechnico University in San Luis Obispo, where they uh, detail on their homepage, I think it's cubesat.org, uh, where you can uh, see the uh, process uh, that you need to do with the ITU, so the International Telecommunication Union in Switzerland, on how to apply for um, uh, satellite uh, frequency. 
the big advantage that uh, you would have as a university is that you uh, could get into the uh, amateur uh, band, uh, which are more easily available uh, because you're educational university. So here we have one question from Brad Sorka. So we want to ask about the suggestion uh, for a startup company. So what are your suggestions to start something like that or something related to the space? So right now is the best time to start something in uh, space. Like five years ago, um, it was um, impossible to think that you can start your own uh, space company because uh, there was like, ah, you need to have uh, billions of uh, euros. Uh, you need to uh, be uh, well with the government uh, and you can anyway not compete with the big uh, companies like Northrop Grumman, Lockheed, Airbus, uh, OHB. But uh, since just a few years ago, it was all kicked off with uh, SpaceX showing that it's possible to have uh, cheap access to space and all these companies that come after him are now enabling uh, missions that were unthinkable before. And the um, best way to get uh, space companies started is maybe looking into um, all the data that is generated with the satellites. There's a lot of uh, funding all over the world available in uh, using the data from satellite to bring to improve life on Earth. So we have one uh, company here in Munich, they are using satellite data to uh, discover where wildfires are starting and they're doing it all with data that are available from satellites, but then also wanting to launch their own satellite constellation in the near term. Then there's other companies that are looking into um, all these uh, images from space and seeing if there's any movement of the ground, if there's any illegal um, construction going on anywhere, any env environmental uh, issues, um, there it's really good to start a company because what you need to do is uh, set up a code and look at all the images and find something uh, different. And there is also a lot of money available at the uh, United Nations. European Commission and from uh, local governments. So great. So finally, so what advice would you give to members of SES who are just starting out and beginning to explore space activities and trying to start new space-related projects? So I um, can highly recommend, um, or what I would suggest is to always follow your uh, passion, to do what you uh, like to do, because this is actually also um, bringing you to a point where you're then happy. If you do something that you don't like, you should better uh, not do it. But space, the nice thing is that there is a lot of passion behind. If you go and meet uh, with your friends and they are telling about what they are doing and you're saying ah you're, you're doing something in space it's always a nice uh, thing to uh, talk about and just um, build things try things if you have an idea just build it if it does not work the first time then just try it again uh, don't be uh, demotivated and uh, try to um, follow as um, much of the uh, space news as possible on YouTube, on uh, Twitter, because there is also uh, the excitement uh, is uh, generating. If you just follow uh, SpaceX, it's amazing. Yeah. So, so we have one more question from Sudan, Sudan Bral. Uh, as you, as how you presented the field and its market, I believe there were competition to your company. Could you highlight a few strategies you incorporated to get ahead of the call? Yeah, that's a, a good point. There's somehow there's always a competition. If um, there is no competition to your uh, product that you're developing, 
either you're so far ahead of anyone else or you're doing something that no one needs. <laughs> so um, we are doing it. Uh, so of course there's also um, competitors to our products, but uh, we are actually uh, trying to talk to the customers and see uh, what they don't like uh, at the uh, competitor's uh, product. What uh, would they like to see uh, change? Because in some instances, it's uh, the products from the competitors are uh, export regulated and we would like to sell our uh, satellite also outside of America. So we, that's why we do it from Europe. Others say, uh, um, we don't want to this disassemble the satellite every time when we test your mechanism then we uh, look how we can um, insert uh, resetability. The other point is um, some people say ah, we would like to see an indication if your uh, system deployed or if the actuator deployed because our competitors they don't have this we implement it. So the thing is you always need to just be um, know what the others are doing, not trying to replicate it, but uh, do it differently and better. So thank you so much, Thomas. Are there any questions from our audience for Thomas? So, yeah, I have a question. So my question is uh, regarding rocket. How does a rocket deploy satellite uh, in a defined inclination angle in an orbit during a deployment? So normally, that's the tricky um, thing with uh, rockets. You can either go um, for um, one rocket launch where you are the prime uh, customer, and then the, um, you are paying for uh, most of the, so you're paying for the mission, and then the uh, rocket uh, is really um, controls to have the right inclination and the right uh, orbit uh, height, which they um, can uh, control depending on where they are launching from and what are the access uh, capability of the uh, rocket. If you uh, want to go for uh, much cheaper launches, if you want to go for ride share or piggyback, where you're just um, um, attached to a mission where the uh, prime satellite already paid for this uh, mission and you only have to pay a fraction for this launch. You just need to go where the main payload is going. You don't have any chance uh, to go somewhere else. There are some uh, ideas. Uh, for example, Rocket Lab is now building their uh, photon uh, kick stage. It's the third stage of a rocket that has, uh, uh, elect uh, that has uh, propulsion on it. And this is really capable of uh, uh, deploying satellites at different, different orbits, different uh, inclinations, but you have to pay the price for that. Because if you have enough money, they bring you where you want to go. Um. Also to the moon, to Mars, just need to have the money. <laughs> Uh, so my another question is, what are your views uh, regarding space debris? As you mentioned earlier, like uh, like there are about 8,500 small satellites and might be more space debris out there. So uh, how a small satellite can help, uh, uh, I mean, can small satellites help to uh, detect and do, you know, like manage space debris? So space debris is a huge uh, problem. It has now over um, 3 million uh, pieces uh, bigger than 10 centimeters. And if uh, one of these um, debris pieces hits an active satellite, it can fraction and create another um, um, amount of uh, space debris. So then you would come into the Kessler effect that you have a cascading effect, you have uh, satellite is destroyed and then yeah more and more satellites are breaking down it's very well shown in the movie uh, gravity if you have not seen it uh, i can really uh, recommend it so on one hand uh, the small satellites will uh, make the problem uh, worse because a lot of these uh, satellites uh, will be in space 
Uh, luckily, uh, most of these small sats are in very uh, low orbits, so are in 500 uh, kilometers or lower. So they re will re-enter very uh, quickly within a couple of years. And then it's also not so critical if they uh, crash into each other because all of the debris should um, be removed quite uh, quickly. Uh, what small satellites can actually uh, do is really uh, help to protect uh, space assets to really see um, is there um, um, a space debris object uh, coming they can monitor the uh, surrounding they can even look in if there's any um, um, act of uh, some other satellite is trying to um, destroy like the GPS satellite and they can protect the satellite from this uh, intruder um, and the other thing that small satellites can do is um, they can um, work on uh, service missions. So you could have a satellite that is flying to different uh, satellites in space that are, for example, not responsive anymore, and they can uh, remove these uh, satellites. Because the issue in space is that um, if you launch a communication satellite, you say uh, it's a lifetime of 10 years, um, you, you you pay for it and after 10 years, it's actually a free satellite. And most of the companies are just uh, keeping their satellite uh, running longer because it's yeah, free service for them until at one point the satellite dies and it's a piece of space junk up there which will stay for 100, 200 years. And small satellites can uh, go to these satellites, grab it and then uh, bring it down. Okay, thank you. Welcome. So, are there any questions? So, I think uh, we are at the end. Okay, perfect. So, thank uh, you. Sorry, I'll let you go. Yeah, no, no, you can continue. Yeah, so uh, it was a pleasure to uh, present uh, to you what are uh, deployable structures? And I hope I could uh, interest you a little bit on what is possible with uh, small cell and deployable structures. So one of the uh, things that I can also recommend is uh, to not, never uh, give up. There will be uh, highs and lows, but that's the exciting thing. Because at the end, I think you're all in uh, sets because you are passionate about space. You want to launch something in space and just follow through, it will be a very rewarding experience. And the last thing I want to say is, feel free to visit us when you ever here in Munich. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Thomas, for giving us your valuable time. And at last we will like to wish you a very good luck for your new workplace. And thank you. Good luck for yeah, your it's future. Yeah, it's coming together. <laughs> yeah. Now, I would like to ask our president to have some closing remarks. Um, sure, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation and I'm pretty sure enjoyed. Uh, I guess everyone else enjoyed the presentation too. And um, all the best for your company and I hope the renovation uh, comes along soon. And I have to check what my colleague is doing upstairs. <laughs> Right. And yeah, sure. For, uh, for sure, we hope to work with you um, in the future too and look forward for possible collaborations. And I guess this event went really well. And thank you for the presentation and thank you for laying out all your information really well. Yeah. Thank you for the kind words. And also, if you, have, uh, if you want to build a satellite, if you need any help with deployable structures, we are here to help you. Sure. Okay. So I guess with that, uh, I guess with that, we are in the end of the program. Um, I'd like to request us we need to end the program formally. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. We thank our speaker for today, Dr. Thomas Bean. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today uh, to share your knowledge and experience with the Nepal. I am certain every one of us had a great time today. 
and we thank all of our audience and the um, attendees for taking the time to join us today. We are very glad that we got the opportunity to successfully conduct this space talk, I mean, a global pandemic. We hope to see you all very soon for the another space talk and we learn a more to learn more about the Sets Nepal to visit our website setsnepal.org and you can also keep in touch with the Sets Nepal on our Facebook page and the Twitter as well. Thank you all so much and hope you all stay safe. Goodbye. Have a good Saturday. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.